I'm sorry you guys only get number two on the list. That's okay. Um, thanks for having me. I want to talk about storytelling. So first of all, this is going to be interactive. I need to get rid of this paper. It doesn't look good in pictures or video or anything. So if you can take some notes for me. You, don't, you know those presenters, they make you participate and you're like, I was just going to sit here, play on email, answer my boss. So this is interactive, but I'm not going to pick on you if you don't want to get picked on. But here are the five things we're going to talk about. So write them down because there's no PowerPoint, unfortunately. Is anybody sad about that? No PowerPoint? My apologies. I did not bring PowerPoint. So the five things we're going to talk about today are politics and buy-in. Number two, story shopping. Number three, love. It's all about love. And number four, um, your tone. And then number five, distribution. Everybody got it? One more time. One more time. Politics and buy-in, number one. Number two, story shopping. Number three, love. Four, authentic tone. And then number five, distribution. So let's get the party started. See, I asked them to move the podium, but now I have no place to put anything. Um, <clears throat> so why is storytelling important? Let me give you an example. I used to be a police reporter, uh, covered all these crappy stories. Great stories, but nothing was ever positive. And one of my favorite stories ever was the one where I tried to investigate um, what were your chances to get a traffic ticket dismissed? Make sense? What were your chances to get dismissed? So I looked at thousands and thousands upon pick, uh, traffic citations, and I found that if you fought your ticket, so if you went to the judge and said, not guilty, and then you argued over your ticket, your chances were about 50-50 to either get a lesser um, ticket or to get it totally dismissed. So pretty good chances if you think about it. And my favorite one that I found was this woman who was driving down this road and she was going 13 miles over the speed limit. I mean, do we have nothing better to do? Okay, I'm not judging any traffic laws, but 13 miles over the speed limit. And she said, Your Honor, I could not have been speeding because I drive by this little bitty church every day. And I say a little prayer. And had I been speeding, I would not have been able to finish the prayer. And I totally finished it because I finish it every day. What do you think? Who believes her? <clears throat> Who does not believe her? This is like a super interesting story. I mean, first of all, it actually happened. And then number two, when I tell this story to journalists, they all go, no, <laughs> whatever. When you tell it to like nonprofit executives, they all go, that's possible, totally. <laughs> Yeah, I think it is. Like, think about this and this and this and this. So who can tell me, without overthinking it, what color car was her, uh, what, color, what color was the car? Red. Red. Red, white. Okay, how about the church? Brick and brown. Brick and brown. Oh, my God. And did it have, like, steps? Like, it went up a few steps? How many? Anybody know? Four. Four, well, fantastic. Wow, I gave you a lot of details in just 10 seconds of that story. Did anybody, could anybody actually feel driving down the road and actually saying a prayer, like if you're religious, no, we're not going to go that, down that road here too far, but if you're religious, did you actually think about a prayer that you might say in a car? Some, sometimes people even do that. So the point is, good stories activate a different part of the brain, right? Because they actually, you feel them. And especially when they're different, when there's some kind of conflict, sometimes when they're unbelievable, um, and sometimes if it's just something you haven't thought about. So this is why storytelling is important, and storytelling is important um, to share stories that are different. So you can't just run around and say things like, we are the state of the art, multidisciplinary, whatever, right? If I hear those words one more time, they will not set anybody apart anywhere, and healthcare doesn't make any difference. Those kind of words do not work. So you have to share something that is different. But to get there, there are five things you have to work through. So who can tell me number one? Politics and buy-in. Politics, I think you were first, right? So, you, so if you haven't figured this out, so whoever um, tells me the answer gets a free book. 
So you can, if you would like it signed, you can get that later. This is my book on authentic storytelling. I only have five. If you want it signed, you do have to bring a pen. I have no pens. I'm digital. So buy-in in politics. You know how many people run around the world and they say, oh, I'm not going to play politics. Have you, do you have those in your office, in your organization? I'm not going to, I'm going to let my actions speak louder than my words or my politics, right? And you know what? I hate to admit, I'd say it, it's baloney. You have to play politics. Now you can kind of minimize how much, how much politics you actually have to play, but you have to figure out whose buy-in do you need to get to share your story. So if you're going to talk about what your organization is doing well. What are some of the things that are worth sharing? Whose buy-in do you think you have to get? Who? The others, right. The other people um, involved, that's number one. And then who else? The, bean, the decision makers. So there's really two ways you can share organizational stories. The first is kind of dangerous. So one is you can just do it. Right? You can try to follow all the laws that are in place and you can share stories. And that's very dangerous because guess what? Marketing or PR might have a problem with that and your boss might have a problem with that. And you know what your boss can do to you? Right? They can fire you. Um, so you might want to get their buy-in explicitly that it's okay to share stories. And what is okay to share? And what are the things that you actually want to share as an organization? Um, and then people involved. So if you're going to share my story, you actually need to have my permission. Right? I mean, not right now, because they're recording the thing. I hope you're tweeting, live tweeting every sentence I say to Twitter at Ctrap. I don't remember the hashtag, if somebody can tell us what it is. Um, but, you know, I don't have much privacy right now, but most people, you should ask for their permission to use their story. And most people don't have a problem with their story being shared, but the problem is, that people don't even recognize stories. So there's a thousand stories around us every day and trained storytellers actually catch. Any guesses? Guess how many trained storytellers catch out of a thousand around us? Six. So six stories. So if you're not trained, you might catch one, right? So you have to think about that. How, what, how are you going to keep an eye out for stories? But first of all, you have to get buy-in. You have to think about who you actually need to talk to, who's actually important for that specific thing. Um, I share a lot of my personal stories. I've, I've shared stories around uh, miscarriages. I've shared stories around all kinds of family things. Nope, I'm not exploiting my family, but I'm sharing stories when they're relevant. Guess who's buy-in I have to get? Well, my, right, my wife. At least. I mean, I'm not going to ask my eight-year-old necessarily for approval, but, you know, they do have to be okay with me sharing those stories. So you kind of have to tread lightly to get started. Most people in my career as a storyteller, I probably have, on, on, I can count them on one hand, the people that have turned me down to share their story. And I've interviewed um, death row inmates, people whose children were just killed, people whose children were dying, um, you know, all kinds of different people. And most of the time, people want to share their story. So don't assume that they don't want to. Um, and it's really up to you to recognize other people. So sometimes people say to me, if I want to share my own story, am I not bragging? Right? So if I'm standing up here and I say, this is the best session you guys have been in today. Yes? See, I mean, you're not even buying that yet, right? You, I can't say it. I cannot say it. That's just bragging, right? But if you share my story, right, that actually works. That's meaningful. So the way you want to think about it is if your team doesn't want to share its own stories because they don't want to toot their own horn, you toot the horn for them. Make sense? So sometimes I have teams, when I'm working with teams and I'm trying to get them to think about how do you share some of the awesome things that they're doing, they say, I don't need the recognition. I don't need the recognition. I don't, I'm not here to get recognition. I really don't. Do you know what I tell them? It's not about you. It's about me. Do you know what I mean? It's actually, not me, like personally, but me, the organization. It's actually not about them. Like, it's nice to recognize them and to, to, 
you know, to make sure people know how awesome they are. But if you really think about it, it's about the bigger picture, like the organization. What are the great things you're doing? How are you going to talk about them? How are you going to share them? So you need to recognize other people for, share, for, for what's going well and what they're coming up with. Innovative kind of things, those kind of things. So buy-in politics. I hate to say it, you got to play politics. That's its life. We can keep saying we don't want to, but we still have to because if you're not going to play them, guess what? You're not going to be quite as successful. So who knows number two? Story shopping. Oh my God. Who said that first? <laughs> do we need to do a... <laughs> Good one. Whoever raised their hand first. Do we need to have like an arm wrestling tournament or something? Yeah. Yeah. Paper, rock, who, paper, rock, scissors. Who, was it one of you guys? I don't even know who said it. You said it? Okay. Okay, well, you guys take one and one take the first half and the other one the back half. Go ahead and take whoever won. I don't know who won. Just say the next one quickest. Oh. <laughs> what? I said it the loudest. You said it the loudest. It's kind of unfair because they're right in my face. Anyway, who came up with these rules? This side is ruled out for the next few. This one, this side right here, this section right here. And you guys will get the last one. Got it? We'll just make these rules up. Okay, what was number two again? Story shopping. So the first step, once you have buy-in, and buy-in, by the way, does not mean a 69-page policy. Because you know how many people actually remember 69-page policies? Anybody? Not even the lawyers remember them when they try to get you in trouble for them. 69 page policies are crap. So it's fine to have it written down, it's fine to have it documented, but really you just want to get conceptual buy-in, right? And yes, you do have to follow all the different laws. Now, the next step is to go story shopping. How do you go story shopping? Does anybody go window shopping? I raise my hand like I do that, but everybody knows what window shopping is, right? You go, you walk around, you see things, and sometimes you buy them, and sometimes you go in the store, and sometimes you go to Amazon and you order it there because you don't want to go in the store because it's more expensive, whatever, right? But the thing is, you need to keep an eye out for stories that are actually happening around you. And how do you do that? First of all, you have to understand what makes a good story. So here are the ingredients of a good story. First of all, it happens. Second of all, it has something to do with your organization in life. So for example, if all I share every day is how I go to the gym every day and I'm going to run and do this and lift and blah, 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 blah. That has nothing to do with my actual job, right? So it needs to have something to do with what you're actually doing. So think about that. And then the other thing is stories need to have some kind of conflict. So if there's always if they're just positive stories, right? Everything is so great. My coffee at the office was hot today. That's not a story. Nobody cares. So do you know what I'm saying? So you have to have some kind of conflict. Now the best stories are the ones where guess what happens to the conflict? Somebody overcame the conflict, right? So that's why you see those stories out there. Somebody overcame cancer. Somebody came up with this new invention. Somebody solved a big problem, whatever it might be. But you do want to think about conflict and then how do people overcome it? Now sometimes it's okay to share stories where the conflict has not been overcome. I really mean it. But if you go to PR, you know what they will say? We don't want to admit that we're not perfect. Is anybody in the room perfect? I'm, anybody? It's two people, two, three. Three people in the room, right? Obviously nobody's perfect, so get over it. That is not how we're gonna live anymore. So, so we wanna think about all those different things. And then it needs to be authentic. And it actually needs to be unique to you. So I do a lot of work with hospitals. And you know Heart Month, you know they have a month, like. They have like 15 different health months every calendar month. Are you with me? Like 15 different ones. And then they have like days in the month and weeks. It's like, you know, you try to celebrate all those. You get no other work done. And um, heart month is in February. So you know what every hospital in the United States does that doesn't listen to me? 
everyone writes an article that says, please be aware of these four signs of a heart attack. How do you think they're going to stand out? They won't, right? So you have to figure out what is it that is unique to you. So if you're just talking about the same crap everybody else is talking about, it's not going to work. You have to talk about um, different things, unique stories. And by that, you go story shopping and you have to identify the stories as they're happening. And here's the thing, who has ever been quoted in the newspaper? Anybody? Has ever, anybody ever been to an event that was covered by the newspaper? Anybody? Uh, sporting events are probably a little different, but other than sporting events, right? Now, when you read the article in the newspaper, who thought, did they go to the same event I went to? <laughs> right? Or if you were quoted, were you like, did they talk to me? Anybody? Yeah, I know it's true. I used to be a reporter. I can make fun of the media because I used to be the media. You know, but seriously, because here's the reason why that happens. Because people have different perceptions of what actually happened. And you know, one of the things that I do sometimes, I go out and I interview experts on their stories, right? And then we actually ghostwrite them. And what's kind of funny, along the same lines, so I, I do this interview, I talk to them for an hour, and I'm like, oh, here are the stories, blah, 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 blah. Right, and I write them down. And then when somebody else writes the same stories, you know what they do? They come up with six totally different stories. And I'm like, I did the interview. What happened? Where did this come from? Who did all this research? How did you have time? And it's because we perceive things differently. Now, some of those things are not always wrong, necessarily. Sometimes they're wrong. There's some things that have facts, but it's about the perception. So think about, um, think about that. You can miss stories. You can miss um, identify them. You can um, um, misanalyze them. You know, somebody else may have meant something different than the way you took it. You know, one of my, I, I used to play football at the University of Iowa a um, long, long time ago. And I remember this case, we were doing sprints. And this guy who actually ended up in the NFL, he took off and he was really moving. Like he was really, like he was moving. And you know what happened? He sprained his ankle as he was running. And because he was moving, you know what I was doing? I was like, yeah, wow, awesome. And then he sprained his ankle. And my, yeah, awesome didn't stop as quickly as he was falling. Do you see what I'm saying? And he was like, you son, you know, I mean, he was pissed at me because he thought I was cheering him getting injured. That's crazy, right? I was like, I didn't do anything, dude. I was happy how fast you were moving. No wonder you made it into the NFL. But so it's perception, so think about that. So we're missing stories sometimes because of perception. And that's why we pick up different stories. So the trick is, to focus on your own story and not necessarily hold other people up to it. But you have to keep an eye out for stories. If you don't do it early on, you will never start. Once you start, you know what happens? This is always a tricky example. You know when you first start working out, it's really hard, right? And then when you, once you're into it, it's really what? <laughs> Did somebody say hard to keep going? People, somebody always says that. No, it's actually really hard to stop. Like today, I didn't go to the gym. I was like, oh my God, I didn't go to the gym. I probably just gained like 10 pounds because I skipped one gym day, you know? But, so it's really hard to stop. So once you get into it, it's really, really hard to stop. But to get going, you have to make an effort. You have to think about what are the stories we can share today? What happened today that I can actually share that people might care about? Now, the people might care about thing, you can overthink it, right? Because you can be, do people really care about that? Do they really care about it? I should do like a national survey before I start sharing this story. Don't, don't overthink it. Just share the story and you'll, you'll figure it out. Okay, what number are we on? Anybody know? And okay, you guys are out. You got enough books. What? Love. Love. Oh, thank you guys. Who said it first? You're the judge. Okay, will somebody get the book? I'm not supposed to get off stage. Sorry, I would have come all the way back there. Love. So, storytelling is not about always being loved by every single person. Are you with me? 
So here's the thing. I just learned this the other day. I was shocked. Not every single person loves me. I mean, I, really, I can't believe it. I, really. You know? You don't love me. What? What? Oh, thank you. Are you. Do you love me or no? Okay, great. So, thank you. Because here's the thing. As we just proved, we want to be loved. And when we don't feel loved, it actually kind of sucks. Has anybody seen the mean tweets on Jimmy Kimmel? When, you know, have you seen those? You know, anybody? Okay, really quickly. So celebrities read mean Twitter posts about themselves on Jimmy Kimmel. And it's hilarious, right? Because they, it's about them and it feels really bad when you do it. So I did that myself. So I've gotten my fair share of mean tweets, so I did that myself. And when I did it, it really kind of blew. It was terrible. I mean, I was like, and people were like, that was so funny. And I'm like, it didn't feel funny. But the thing is, we got to get over this whole thing that everybody is going to love us because it won't happen. The people that need to love us are the ones that actually are part of our community. Some people call them target audience. I hate that term. You know why I hate it? Target audience. It feels like I'm shooting at you, right? Target audience. Very aggressive. I know it's a term, long, it's a long standing term in the marketing world, but if I wouldn't pick on it, I didn't have anything to pick on for 10 seconds. So um, I like interested community. And those are the people you're after. So for example, you know who is not my target audience? The nitpickers. Do you know who I'm talking about? You publish a blog post, you wrote it on the phone, on the plane, and it's like 800 words, and you have like one paragraph in the la you have like one arrow error in the last paragraph, and they'll send you a lengthy email and say, this entire blog post cannot be correct because there is a typo in the last paragraph. This one typo undermines your credibility. I get it, people. Like, I want to have perfectly written blog posts, too. But bottom line is, like, if you're going to be that silly over my blog post, I, I don't care. I really don't. So we just got to kind of get over that. And then one time I had somebody who actually emailed me and they said, your articles, all of your articles, ignore the complexities of life. I will no longer read your articles. Like, Thank you. That was my intent. Because we don't have to make, to make everything so difficult. You know what I mean? Everything has to have a process. Everything has to go through approval hell to ever get done. It takes months and months and months to get done. Um, just kind of live it and try to get it done. So, um, so that's, that's that. You don't have to be loved by everybody. If everybody loves you, bottom line is, you either are not sharing enough stories or you're not sharing all your relevant stories. You know nonprofits do this? I used to be a United Way VP. It was a great time. It really was. United Ways were really trying to do digital transformations when I was with them. And, but you know what nonprofits do? They say, we have no opinion on this issue. And I'm like, but aren't you raising money to fight that same issue? Yeah, but we have no opinion on it in the news. Do you see what I mean? It doesn't work that way. You always have an opinion about the things you care about. So whatever your passion is, whatever your mission is, so if your mission is to help people, you know, to help advance medical innovation, you have to have an opinion about it. Because if you don't, you're just a cog in the wheel. I mean, you think about it. You have to have an opinion about things. And sometimes it needs to be controversial. And it doesn't have to be all the time, but just think about what is your point of view um, and, and how do you talk about it. And once you hit that stride really well, people will actually expect you to say the things that you say. So I'll give you an example. I was in a meeting and they said, you know how people go on social media and they overshare stuff? Do you know what I'm talking about? What do you think a guy like me would say who talks about storytelling like all day long and in his sleep? Honey, did you dream, are you dreaming about storytelling? Wake up, you're being too loud. No, but you know um, what I said, I said, they're just sharing their story. 
It's not a big deal. Give them a break. And honestly, so there are people who overshare stuff. You know, people share like pictures. Like, does anybody know what this is on my skin? Have you seen those pictures? <laughs> <laughs> what piece of your skin is that? And then they tell you and you're like, oh! I didn't even know that piece of your skin looks like that. Anyway, so, but people are just sharing their story. So there's a fine line that you don't care, but guess what? Maybe you're not their target audience. So it's not always about being loved. It's about being loved by the right people, whoever that might be. I've decided, I'm, I'm being a little confrontational about it, quite frankly, because I actually like nitpicky editors. I really do. But you know, that, so I say that because it's kind of, gets the point across, right? Nitpickers are not my target audience. Okay, all right, so you guys are out. Is that right? What number are we on? Number four. Who can keep track of this presentation? What? Oh, okay, you said it first. That was smart. You know what he just did? He said something, I looked at him, and then he said it. That's smart, you can get a book. <coughs> the authentic tone. So we already kind of covered that. There's a trick for you guys. If you, there's only one book left. Um, if you, who said that? <laughs> wow, go get the next one. You may have to remind me what that was when we get to it. <laughs> That was really smart. Wow, there's always a loophole to these rules. Um, okay, so the authentic tone. So think about what you sound like. So when, you, when, when organizations actually go through this branding exercise, you know what they do? They pick these words on how they want to sound. And they usually end up like friendly, compassionate, informational, you know, crap like that. And then when you read their stuff, it reads like a press release. And we could, do, we could talk about press releases all afternoon. You know who reads press releases? Anybody know? Ha <laughs> ha! Good one. No, the press does not read press releases ever. In fact, I have CNN on record. They say, we don't do stories of press releases. Sometimes you get it coverage, but very rarely. The only people that read press releases are the ones who actually wrote them, and then their bosses, and then they sent them through 15 layers of approval, and everybody picks every word apart. Are you with me? I call that approval hell. And then two weeks later, they send it out, and they call it a news alert, right? News alert. Took them two weeks to produce. And when you read it, it's crap. And your copy cannot read like that, right? Tell a story, be friendly. And I've probably, I mean, I've sworn, I don't think, but I've used some harsher words than normally. And, you know, you gotta pick your tone. And sometimes you can explain it. So if you read online, a lot of people are swearing online. Have you noticed that? They do like, you know, all those acronyms. I can't say them because they're recording this. I don't wanna be known for using potentially rude acronyms. So they use all these acronyms, and my tone usually is that I don't use any of that language. So I actually wrote an article, and I wrote an article about how and when never to swear in articles and blog posts. And I said, but I occasionally bold things for emphasis. Get it? Bold it? They swear I bold them. So you can totally kind of make fun of some of those things without being too confrontational. Um, but you want to hit your tone, whatever it is. However you sound, that's how you should sound publicly. It's actually harder than it sounds. Because you know what marketing people do when they try to write for an organization? They sit down and they think, this is how it's supposed to sound. And then everything anybody ever writes says, I am so pleased to share this authentic story with you today. Are you with me? They're so pleased. It's marketing gobbledygook. Nobody actually pays any attention to it. You know, so you want to start, you want to talk like humans talk. Brian Kramer, who's a marketer out of San Diego or California, somewhere on the West Coast, and he has this concept, and it's called, there's no more business to business marketing, no more business to consumer marketing, it's all human to human. 
So my job now is to fly around the country and help humans talk and behave like humans. I mean, who comes up with this crap? Seriously. Like, why are we helping humans talk like humans? Just talk like you normally talk. Be yourself. That's what's going to set you apart. I know it's harder because we're, we're in this transitional phase. I totally get it. You know, people expect us to behave a certain way, um, and it's hard to kind of get started. So something to think about um, as you're starting, as you're pushing your organization to share better stories, but the more you can hit a human-sounding tone and voice, it really, really will help you stand out because it's really still hard. American Airlines, as much as some of, them, some of us hate them, you know, they respond to every tweet. Has anybody, anybody hate them? Love them? You don't care? You don't fly enough that you have an opinion? But, <clears throat> so anyway, they get like thousands of tweets a day, I think, about people complaining about what's not working, right? They lost their luggage, plane is delayed, whatever it might be, all day long. And when they, res they respond to every single person, and then what happens, they actually make it kind of fun. So one time I posted a picture and I said, hey, look at this, cool, I got upgraded, I got some room, I can actually work. And they wrote back, and I don't remember what the hashtag was, but they said, they made up this hashtag, and I wrote back, and then they said, enjoy the flight, blah, 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 and they were human, right? They didn't have to resolve an issue, they just communicated with me, like humans do, right? People always ask me, we're gonna talk about channels in a second, when, how, when do you respond online? When should you talk to people? You know when you should talk to people online? Same rules as offline apply. So if somebody comes up to me, somebody please come up to me afterwards and tell me how great I did. But if somebody comes up to me afterwards and says, that was awesome, what do I say to them? Thank you. So if somebody sends me a tweet and says, that was so awesome, what should I say to them? I seriously, I'm not kidding. I've had people email me and say, somebody send us a nice tweet. What should we do? I'm like, let me bill you an hour for this advice. <laughs> That's how it works, people. I mean, seriously, right? You say the same thing. If somebody says something to me offline and says, dude, what the heck are you talking about? I'll say, what do you mean? Let's talk about it, right? Let's go have a beer or whatever and we'll talk about it, right? Same thing. Now, the difference online, there's a lot of trolls online. So what I do is, and what I recommend people do, I always respond once. And if they are a troll, I'll let it go after that. So one time, so on my blog, and I do recommend, if you have a, a blog or whatever, I do recommend that you turn comments off. I think comments are a waste of time, honestly. There's too much spam, it's just a pain. You know, some, you get like these 15 spam comments and they all say, great pose, fantabulous, that is actually a word. You know, all those different things, and guess what everybody says? We have 15 comments, yay, they're all spam. Plus they didn't add any value. <clears throat> so I recommend to turn comments off and I've turned them off on my blog and I've written about why you turn them off. So I had this guy write a blog post about me turning comments on my blog off and how he disagrees with that. <coughs> the blog post was fine. I didn't link to it. I read it and then he, got, he wanted to get into this big lengthy discussion because you couldn't have a discussion with me on my blog and I just said, but you are having a discussion with me on Twitter. What's the difference? The difference is that he wanted to link back to his blog from my blog, but bottom line is, you know, you can turn them off and you can shut them out at some point. But I always respond at least once, and then I let it go if they're trolls. So same rules apply, don't overthink it. <coughs> Excuse me. Distribution. So here are the current channels. So every day I turn around, there's a new channel. Yesterday, Instagram launched a new thing, Instagram Stories, now launched. Right? The day before there was something else. I mean, every day, Snapchat, people use Snapchat, people Twitter, Facebook. Now there's Facebook Live. YouTube still exists. Anybody know about MySpace? <coughs> Why is everybody laughing? Because it's, right? So MySpace, what? Tom's my friend. Yes, yeah. 
he is something. Um, so MySpace, nobody really needs to care about it, honestly. You don't have to worry about it. But guess how many people a month go to MySpace? I have no more books to give away, but if you get this number correct, I would send you one. Six, no. <coughs> 59 million per month. Now, they're all musicians. I assume they're not very good, because if they were, they would be on Pandora. I don't know. But uh, seriously, there's 59 million musicians and their fans that go to MySpace per month. So it's not dead, it's just super irrelevant for all of us, unless you're in a band and you want to showcase your stuff. You know? So, but right now, the ones you want to focus on, LinkedIn, Facebook is still out there, unfortunately, even though marketers have ruined Facebook for all of us, quite honestly. Um, I'm kind of giving up on, uh, you know, I actually, I, I publicly announced I'm quitting Facebook. I'm still on it, but I quit it. So my chief strategy officer tweeted, even though C-Tramp is quitting Facebook, it's still viable to healthcare organizations, and it, it totally is. But, but it is kind of getting a pain, right? Because marketers are really, really ruining it for us. Um, but Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, um, uh, Snapchat actually has more users than Twitter, but tw Snapchat is really hard for organizations to use. So is any live video platform like Periscope. And you know why? Because what does live video do? What? It shows it's live. It's live, right? If I was, to, yeah, it shows whatever. Like once you're live, you're live. You can't take it back, and that's a real problem to marketers. And the other thing is, it's actually a problem for people on the ground to implement. I was helping a physician one time, and I said, "Hey, we should do this Periscope," and she said, "Oh yeah, cool. We'll do it. Let's do it." And you know how you do in per periscopes? You hold the phone like this, right? And you talk to the phone, and you have thousands of thousands of people watching. No, I'm just kidding. Like maybe 10 once you get started. But you can grow that audience, obviously. So you have people watching, and you know what she said? She goes, yeah, let's do it. And then she says, could you hold the phone? <coughs> I'm like, sure. So she gave me the phone. She stood over there, and I held the phone, and she goes, Hi, it's so good to talk to you, blah, 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 and we're going to do this, and I hope you join us. Thanks for tuning in. I'm so-and-so with this organization. I'm like, is this the newscast? See what I mean? So it's so hard to actually hit our right voice because we're used to, that's how you're supposed to sound when you're on TV. So when you look at healthcare organizations today, um, <coughs> you know, they're doing very traditional things. And, and Periscope especially, it's like TV. And it's terrible. And then they all wonder, why do we only have like 10 viewers? I can tell you why, because it's not very fun to watch, you know? So, so think, about, think about those channels. Um, other than that, I'm sure there's gonna be other things down the road. Um, I usually don't worry about the channels. Here's the trick on channels. Use them as they come up and then figure out what your story is and just readjust your story, reformat your story for those different channels. Because channels change all the time. How many years do you think I would give Facebook? What will happen to Facebook, do you think? <coughs> I can't hear anything. What? And it's gone, right? I mean, that's kind of what I'm thinking. You know, it's. Like, everybody goes, but they own everything. And I'm like, who owned everything before Google? Not Google. <coughs> Excuse me. So things will continue to change. Um, but your story won't change, right? You just need to figure out what the current channel is. So if I had any, adv any advice, what's the one channel to pick? It's your website. This center actually um, has a really nice blog. Have you seen their blog? It's very nice. They actually, they have a lot of nice stories on there. And that's a good example how to get started. You know, they have even consumer-focused stories. They have nice videos. It doesn't always need to be so polished. You can just share things as they come up. Periscopes, Instagram photos perform best when they are not polished. Really, if you look like at um, Jimmy Fallon's videos that they do for The Tonight Show, they're like not polished at all. 
and I know he has a much bigger audience than any of us, but still, it's a good example. You know, a lot of people are, are doing that. I one, I one time worked with a community theater, and they did this very nice commercial, and they published it online, it had like a couple hundred views, and it cost a lot of money. And then somebody went backstage of the actors, and they did like a video, you know, they uploaded to YouTube, of like, look at backstage, look what we do, here's where we get dressed. You know, all these different things, kind of interesting. Thousands of views. And it didn't cost anything. In fact, it was produced in their downtime. So think about how do you do that and then share the things. But if you only had one channel, I would go with your website and here's why. As much as we all focus on social media, social media is not king. Search engine traffic is actually king. So guess what people do? When they search for anything, they, uh, when they need anything, they go online, they go to Google, and they search for how to do it, right? So if you only get to choose one channel, I would focus on your website, share the content on there, share it on a blog, whatever it might be, um, and then use the other channels, the ones I mentioned, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, which of course is owned by Facebook, so we'll see where that ends up down the road. Um, but that's what I would do. You can get started today, you can get started tomorrow, you can even start today. Share stories from sessions today. What are some key takeaways? You don't have to overthink them. I was talking to somebody earlier who, you know, they're going to give a report back to their departments, right, on, on what they learned. Why not share some things now? I don't know what's so confidential about it, right? Some opinions, some thoughts. Anything that happened, I mean, there's stories all around us. You just need to make up your mind to do them. Um, hope you do it. Good luck. And, uh, I mean, stay real, guys. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <coughs> oh, yeah. <coughs> no questions. No, I'm kidding. Are there any questions? Thank, thank you. So you bet. Thank you. Um, so, uh, this is <coughs> you want to take any more time right now? Depends on the last opportunity for today. Oh. That cough wasn't too bad until the end. That cough wasn't too bad until the end. Before you start, just like to get a chest cold or something. Yeah, something. You bet. Yes. Good. Good. Great. Thank you. Yep. You did a great job. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Would you actually sign my You card? betcha. Do you have a pen though? Because I don't, well, actually, I don't have one in here. I'm sure I have one here in my purse. <coughs> <laughs> we usually have a hundred up here, but. I got one. That was actually harder than.